what are we waiting for? My Chinese girlfriend asked, somewhat confused, as we sat facing each other in the privacy of my apartment. For weeks, we had been talking about the prospect of getting married. I held back. I wasn't supposed to marry a Gentile, I thought. It would be a betrayal of my family, my ancestors, my tradition. Yet it would sound racist if I told her that. And then I realized it would sound racist to me as well. I was raised with a lox and bagels Judaism, replete with misconceptions and negative stereotypes about the religious life. The few laws that we kept, such as not eating pork, we did out of habit or tradition. We weren't like the religious Jews, you know, the ones that walk about in the dead heat of summer in their long black frocks and round fur hats, portraying an archaic image. They believed that God himself demanded that we keep kosher, or for that matter, that we don't flick a light switch on or off on Friday night. Ludicrous, I thought. Like many of my peers, I had an affinity for Jewish culture, and that's where it ended. And like many young Jews, I developed an interest in philosophy and spirituality. In college, I studied Marxism, humanism, Platonism, feminism. I wanted to know if any of them was the key to fixing the world. I delved into the teachings of Buddhism and Christianity. I traveled to the Arctic for a month, hoping to taste native spirituality. In the process, I became disillusioned with one ism after another. And Judaism is an ism that was never even on my radar until I met Belinda. At first, it was exotic and exciting. I was expanding my horizons. But wait a moment, were any of the Buddhist practices idol worship? Did it matter if our future children ate pork and shrimp? And not only that, as I was confronted with an ancient, rich, and fascinating Chinese tradition that I knew so little about, I was challenged to identify what was unique and special about my Jewishness. It's interesting, when you're forced to explain or justify your beliefs or values or practices to a foreign audience, the conversations become stimulating, different from what you get when you hang around like-minded people. Ladies and gentlemen, interfaith dating provides a unique opportunity for Jewish growth by enabling a Jew to look at his or her religion through a fresh lens. In my case, my Chinese girlfriend would ask me questions about Judaism and I'd run and dig up answers. And not just any answers, they had to be the most satisfying answers possible so that she'd find Judaism appealing. In the process of sharing my heritage with her, I discovered more and more of its treasures. In the space of four years, I went from not even having a mezuzah at my front door to being a kippah-clad, shomer Shabbos, tefillin donning Jew. That's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is that it doesn't always work this way. Interdating often leads to intermarriage, non-Jewish children, and further disaffection from our heritage. But in my case, the exact opposite happened. And I am by no means unique in this regard. So what accounts for the difference? Let's face it. Secular Jews who will only date other Jews do so because of family and community expectations, or because of the Holocaust, or anti-Semitism or because there's a 4,000-year-old legacy to pass on. Yet all those reasons are tenuous, tainted with guilt. Many cultures exert pressure to marry one's own kind, but why give in to it, especially in the multicultural society? The point is that falling in love can override all those considerations. And here, I think, is the key. It all boils down to the bifurcation of Judaism into those 
who abide by it as a religion, and by religion I mean an all-encompassing, sacred, meaningful way of life, and those who identify with it as a culture. The recent Pew study asked respondents to identify what they consider essential to their Jewish identity. 14% said eating traditional Jewish foods. 42% said having a good sense of humor. I wish I were more Jewish in that regard. <laughs> well, if that's what Judaism is to them, then there's not much to be lost, and there's probably a whole lot to be gained by intermarrying. In the same vein, Belinda and I realized that culturally we can take the best of both worlds. We can celebrate Rosh Hashanah and we can celebrate Chinese New Year's. We can eat matzah ball soup one week and wonton soup another. We can laugh at Jackie Mason jokes and dabble in Confucius. We'd both be enriched. But if, on the other hand, Judaism is also about Torah and what God wants of us, then the ramifications are totally different. The Torah, for example, says that a Jew must only marry another Jew. So if we want to get, if we want to curb intermarriage, we have to get more young Jews to identify with Judaism as a religion and not simply as a culture. That's easier said than done. I believe that in our cosmopolitan and cynical society, three ingredients are essential in Jewish education. Number one, Jewish education must cultivate curiosity. The story is told of a Hasidic boy who comes home from school one day, proudly displaying to his mother a handful of candies that he received from his Rebbe. The mother, stupefied, but knowing that the Rebbe sometimes gives out a candy or two for correctly answering a difficult question, turns to her son and says, Shloimele, wow, you must have known the answer to a question that nobody else in your class knew. And the boy looks up at his mother and smiles. No, ma, he says. I was the only one in my class who asked the Rebbe a question that he couldn't answer. It is important that every Jew know that Judaism loves questions, that we are different from other religions that say, you just need to believe, you just need to have faith. Indeed, it is the permission and the encouragement to be curious, curious that was invaluable in helping me gain access to the religious worldview and discovering tremendous meaning and intelligence in it. The second ingredient, Judaism must reinforce the basics. What's the point of exposing a Jewish child to religious texts if he doesn't for a moment believe in the splitting of the sea or that Noah lived to be 950 years old and built this ark to house the planet's animals or that God created Adam and Eve? In the face of science and common sense, he will perceive Judaism as laughable and his educators as naive. Rather, Jewish education must address the foundational questions. How do we know that God exists? How do we know that the Torah is from God? How do we know that the Torah was not changed? And how do we know that the rabbis are interpreting it correctly? And the third ingredient. Jewish education must showcase the applicability of Judaism to all aspects of the contemporary world. It was mind-opening for me to discover that Judaism addresses, it reaches into every nook and cranny of human activity, from business transactions to sexual interaction, from raising children to comforting mourners, from praying to God to protecting our ecosystem. When Judaism is viewed as more than a compartmentalized part of our lives, then our identification with it and the attachment to it is bolstered. In closing, a tremendous blessing for me in my interdating journey was that it forced me to dive into learning anew, to unlearn what I thought Judaism was, 
and to relearn it with a depth and authenticity that fundamentally transformed my identity as a Jew. And so I believe that a big part of Jewish education today must consist of unlearning what we assume Judaism is all about. Is Judaism about not eating pork because of habit or tradition? Or is it about keeping the kosher laws because that's one of God's ways of ensuring that we remain a holy nation? Is Judaism about eating potato pancakes and giving gifts on Hanukkah? Or is there a more profound message in the holiday? Is Judaism about cultivating a sense of humor? Or is it about cultivating a relationship with God? Every week at the end of Shabbat, we recite Havdalah, whereby we bless the Creator who distinguishes between the sacred and the secular, between light and darkness, between Israel and the nations, between the seventh day and the six days of work. To this list, I would like to add another distinction, one that we ourselves, not God, must make. To distinguish between authentic Torah Judaism and its myriad cultural echoes. Perhaps if we did that, we wouldn't need to interdate in order to grow Jewishly. Thank you. Thanks for watching Eli Talks. Click through or subscribe to the Eli Talks channel for more inspired Jewish ideas.